Let's throw our hands in the air Woo-hoo. as we soar through the sky. Yatta. We'll catch the sun Woo-hoo. with your hand in mine. And yeah. if we work as a team, everything will be fine. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's care, care of the what now? Let's henshin and start the show. Hello, fellow creatures who are holding perfectly still because we never told you you could move. Oh, crap, we forgot about you. Oh, no. Welcome to Cure of the What Now. You can move now. This is the only show where we'll remember to tell you you can move. I'm your host, Kat, and I am a big old blah, 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 water thingy creature. There's many of me. I can absorb the other ones to get even more. Can you punch water? No, I'm invincible. I mean, turns out in this episode you can't. Well, that's dumb. I would... <laughs> All right, fantastic. <laughs> the show that we love enough to do a podcast on is dumb. I'm your co-host, Joel, and also I'm here to remind you that it is, in fact, episode 29 of Kill War of the What Now? Oh, yeah, I forget that every time, even though I mean to include it. Thank you for being such a useful partner. Of course. Also, I'm a sentient palm tree that will appear in your dreams. Oh, no. In order to give you makeup tips. (laughs) Too much mascara. Too much. You got to dial it back just a little bit. Listen, the blue eyeliner? Mm -mm. (laughs) Mm-mm. Nope. I... So every girl, I think, goes through the, I'm experimenting with makeup, so I look kind of like a clown phase. And so I had, like, a solid year, I think, where I only wore bright green eyeliner. Oh, And I thought it looked really cool, but, like, don't think I could pull that off now that I'm Mm. approaching 30. Do you think that, because I've never dabbled with makeup myself, could it work with the right outfit? Uh, the right outfit or the right, like, eyeshadow to go with it. Okay. Uh, part of the problem, too, is just my skin tone. Ah. So, golds look really good on me, for example, um, but cooler colors don't necessarily. And so someone who was, like, darker skinned or really tan, I think would look amazing in, like, emerald green eyeliner. Okay. Yeah, very nice. This has been uh, Makeup Corner uh, <laughs> today. That's a new segment. That... Tropical Rouge Precure supposedly has a makeup theme, so or <laughs> motif, pardon me. Mm, motif. Yeah. Joel, do you have any announcements or pre-show business to address? I don't believe so. By the time you're listening to this, we will have uploaded a bonus episode uh, for the Sly Cooper games. We focus more so on the fourth game, Thieves in Time, but we also talk about the first three. And that that was a lot of fun. Uh, It will be up on the YouTube, and we'd appreciate it if you gave it a listen. If you're only here for Precure but you have a gamer friend, maybe you could recommend it to them. Absolutely. And if you ever want a guest on an episode, like we're super open to the idea of that. We like collaborations and there are so many seasons of Precure. If we only talk about them by ourselves, we're never going to get through all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. I've got our lead in question for this week. Absolutely. If you were going to unlock a new attack in a dramatic moment of self-revelation, what item would become your new weapon? Uh, Okay, so like, what if... I don't actually own action figures. I wasn't one of those kids, you know, or or whatever you want to call them, but like, maybe like an amiibo or something, or like, you know? Because I'm, I'm imagining a situation kind of like if you've seen My Hero Academia, where the main character really, really looks up to All Might. I'm imagining a situation where, like, the legendary Precure or whatever exists in this universe that I'm in existed, and I look up to them, and that's what makes me the up-and-coming hero is that I want to emulate them. So I imagine holding, you know, an action figure of them, and in the dramatic moment, I get a power-up that makes me more like them. Okay, okay, I like that. I think if it were the two of us together as a team unlocking a new attack, microphone, is okay, kind of sure. the obvious go-to. I was also thinking a uh, video game controller for you. <laughs> ah, I could see that working. I could see that working. Honestly, the first thing that came to mind was like a pen, but I just, I don't know. I guess there was a, uh, um, was it Common Writer that had the book season recently? Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's not quite as nerdy as I was thinking, but I was thinking like, that doesn't seem like something that Precure would do. Thank you so much for giving me a really easy answer because I wasn't sure how I was going to answer this for me. My uh, drawing stylus for my computer. Yeah, see? That looks really nice. And like Hikaru had the Twinkle Imagination pen. 
she drew on oh, her little yeah, accessories. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I would like draw my big laser attack. <laughs> what if you had a pet axolotl that you carried around with you and you opened the case and he, they jumped out and you did like some kind of fusion dance or something. You I touched his heart that. paw. I know Karurun is a seal fairy, mm. but the next axolotl I get is ax- a- a- absolutely, <laughs> absolutely going to be named Karurun. Oh, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything else that you think uh, could be an interesting... Do you think that there is pressure at Toei to always come up with a new item, or is it okay if they do rings nine times out of ten? No, I think it's okay. Common Rider has been doing belts for years, so... Oh, well, yeah, but that's... It's not... Common Rider's not marketed towards girls, and so, you know, the pens they kind of use to draw accessories, and they have rings, and they have, like, the blush, or, um, not the blush, the lipstick and stuff, so I think there's only a limited number of things they can pull from, and I think eventually they're going to repeat, but I would assume that they want the items to be unique between seasons so it doesn't feel like, oh, we're getting this again. Also, it sells more toys. Mm -hmm. So, Speaking of uh, toys, I still need those Go Princess keys, so. Right. Just just throwing that out there for no reason. (laughs) But thank you for participating in my discussion question. I was was proud of myself that I came up with a relevant one this week before (laughs) you were like, I've got one. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Which I think means it's time for me to give a succinct summary. Please do hit me with that sweet, sweet, succinct summary. All right. So is the beginning of this episode actually relevant to this episode? I'm going to say no. Uh, There's Minatsu and Laura are told about mirrors that have magical powers in fairy tales, basically. Minatsu tells Laura. Right. Uh, And so they do like this little bit where it's like, uh, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's going to become the next mermaid princess? (gasps) Of course it's me, or mermaid queen. And then Minatsu, who Tropica shines the most brightly, and Laura throws herself in the mirror and she goes, that's also me. I love her so much. It was super cute. This episode 100% is a Minatsu x Laura shipping uh, moment. If you do that, if not, it was just a beautiful friendship. It's a strong friendship, but... but it definitely focuses on those two, whether you read the subtext into it or not. While that's going on, the butler is tasked with getting the motivation power because the queen is having this nightmare and the nightmare has a character in it, which we'll go into in a second. But basically the butler himself is going to cause mayhem today. So, okay, maybe this will be the episode where things get more serious. He summons a bunch of water yarn a daw that appear all over the city, and some of them are just kind of raindrop shaped, but some of them are uh, like a starfish, and there's one that's kind of like a beluga whale looking kind of thing, and so they look like different sea creatures. And the girls have a hard time finding the motivation power, because there's like hundreds of these things, and Laura can't scan them. But eventually, they realize if they gather them all in one place, they'll probably find the real one. Mon- you want my motivation power? You can have it. <laughs> <laughs> I left it all in one water balloon thing. Manatsu eventually splits up from Laura. Uh, when the Yarn Da attack, they're all over the city, so really only Manatsu and Laura are together. Manatsu's like, I gotta go back to the school. We left Karuru in there. Oh no. And then she gets. Yarn Dodd. She gets trapped and they're tra- they're draining her motivation power. She's able to resist a bit. She's not completely out, but it's clear that like there's a ticking time bomb going on. If if they can't save her in time, she'll lose all motivation forever or something like that. And then they realize that they can send her their motivation power through mirrors. Laura has a, a personal mirror that she does for her makeup and stuff. And Manatsu has a mirror that they made during the festival. Yeah, during episode. the last episode. And so this beam of light goes through and Manatsu breaks out. And that allows them to talk to the ghost of the legendary Precure who's there. And she goes, hey girls, I heard you might want to power up. And so... They get a new power-up, they get a new form, they get a new attack that is 
elephant themed of all we'll get things. There. We'll get there. And they uh they defeat the uh the super strong Yarnada. I think it's still a, a Zetai Yarnada or a Zen No, Zen? it's a super Zen Zen Yarnada. Oh, yeah. I, I missed that part. So they were finally able to defeat that thing and they're just gonna continue to Tropica Shine. The witch also dreamed about the Densetsu Precure, and it was a bad dream, and she pooped out another egg. Yes. Now, Joel, I'm going to go rewind back to the moment when you said, was the intro to this episode relevant to the episode? I'm going to say no. I am going to say yes, because it was an opportunity for Minatsu to push the dresser they made into the camera and go, remember this object, it is important. And technically speaking, the reason that Minatsu separated from Laura was because Karurun was at the school, because Minatsu told Karurun not to move, and then they forgot to tell Karurun that they were allowed to move. Yeah, how and did they, they just leave Karurun at school? I don't know. Like, you think that Laura would, like, check. You know, you check for your wallet, you check for your keys, you check for your sea fairy, you know? <laughs> Laura's not ready to be queen. She can't even take care of a fairy. <laughs> <laughs> Did you- Karun is her ta- Tamagotchi and it has two little poop symbols and she forgets to clean up after Karun. Oh no, sometimes. it's gonna turn into the creepy man face. <laughs> <laughs> Did you like this episode? Yes, for the most part. You know me, I always find something to critique. I think that the power up kind of came out of nowhere. I think the reason that they rushed the episode, or it felt kind of rushed, is because there was so much going on. The the Witch of Delays was having nightmares. Laura and Minatsu had, like, this sleepover kind of uh, moment where they were giggling and stuff. Minatsu had a dream. Minatsu got uh, Yarnay Dodd. The the legendary Precure showed up. There was just so much going on that I don't think they could have adequately fleshed it out. But it feels like the solution to why did they get power-ups is because... They have motivation power, which they've had for the last 28 episodes. So I'm not clear on why now, other than the fact that we're getting further into the season. But I loved the humor in this episode, and the action was kicked up a notch. We'll talk about it, but this was probably the best animated episode of Precure I've ever seen. Mm, Go Princess had some spectacular animation, this was right there with Go Princess. Yeah, there was one scene in particular where I don't know if this is the proper term. My apologies. I'm not much of a filmography person, but it was kind of like a like a gyroscope or something, like where the camera kind of like rotated around Minatsu in a moment of action before she delivered like a punch or whatever. There was some really good. It was really interesting too because it was very choppy. A lot of the fighting but I liked it. Like it sold the frantic energy of the fight in a way that I don't think they always do. Also, you could tell that the characters were being drawn by somebody else this episode. Like their, their faces were slightly different and the facial expressions were much more exaggerated. I really enjoyed it. Okay. So it sounds like you were very positive about this episode. Yes. I don't like the legendary precure. The sentient uh, palm tree. Why? Is her head a coconut tree? Well, because because it fits in with the theme. Listen. Feel like, feel like, feel like they didn't make papaya a papaya. They didn't have to make her explicitly a palm tree. That's true. I do like that she's a green cure, though. We don't have enough of those. Yes. Uh, Twitter was pretty excited uh, when the leaked screenshots came out of what she was going to look like. And a lot of people are like, please let there be a green cure next season. Do you... Do you have a theory or have you read anywhere about, like, why they're averse to the color green? Green is not a popular color. Okay. Yeah, fair uh, enough. It's not a popular color in general, but also specifically it's not a popular color with girls. Okay. I could see that. I could see that. Although yellow, I wouldn't expect to be a popular color. Like, I would rather have more green cures than yellow. See, at the same time, I think of pink and yellow as the traditional girl colors a little bit so that those two make sense to me but yeah okay i just i wasn't sure sometimes you've read articles or seen tweets that i haven't so i was wondering if you'd seen anything give me a pre-cure season with cool colors only blue purple green cyan light blue aquamarine teal (laughs) there was a movie about mermaids named called aquamarine in like the mid-2000s i think i remember seeing commercials for that Yeah. yeah 
Uh, didn't they have, they had an episode of, oh gosh, I don't remember what it's called, but Ryusuger or whatever, the, one of the Power Ranger seasons, sorry, Sentai seasons, where they had dinosaurs. One of the movies, or the final episode, was set in the future, and the, they got their costumes mixed up, so there was like, a gray, a blue, a dark blue, and something else, and the villains are like, this lousy composition is, or this, co- this color composition is lousy. Yeah. <laughs> That was the dinosaur season that we watched. I just can't remember what the name of it is. And there's so many dinosaurs. Well, and that's why I say the one that we watched, because (laughs) there are so many. Give me a dinosaur precure season. We're getting off track. This is not a Super Sentai or dinosaur podcast. It could be, though. It could be. So, Joel, having said that you did enjoy this episode, despite some of the kind of plot holes or the places where you had to stretch your your disbelief. What were some of your favorite scenes or quotes? Papaya with the kill shot was incredible. So uh, Karurun at some point, I guess, ends up in like the river or something. And so it's all of the girls minus Minatsu. Uh, and Karurun jumps out of the water behind them. But this entire episode, the girls have been fighting water monsters that have been coming out of bodies of water. So Papaya turns and does the eye laser without even checking to see what's coming out of the water. She was ready to get the kill shot. And friendly fire, she hit Karurun. She lasered Karurun. They bullied that child this episode. I feel so bad for Kuru. Yeah, so that was probably one of my favorites. If you watch this episode, or if you're on Twitter looking at Precure stuff, or you have Precure mutes, I'm sure you saw it. But the one where uh, uh, Summer picks up Karurun, and she's fighting a single water droplet enemy that's like shooting at her like a bullet, and she's like quickly dodging out of the way. That was... It was fantastic. I loved it. I almost feel like I need to watch this episode a second time just to kind of get straight in my head all of the things that I loved about it. But there's a scene where Songo jumps in the air and then upside down does her X and Cure La Mer lands on the X and then uses it to jump off. It was almost like a flying saucer type thing. Yeah, it was it that was, was really so cool. awesome. Yes. And I feel like Songo led the charge to rescue Minatsu at one point. Like Songo did something and we both went, It's our girl! She gets to do a thing. Yes, absolutely. I also you already kind of mentioned this, but I really loved the Laura and Minatsu being cute together scene oh, where cute. Laura pushes Minatsu out of the way to be her Laura goblin self. <laughs> And then Minatsu starts tickling her. Mm. That was really cute. I think I've mentioned before, my dad likes the show Gumball because he feels like it perfectly captures what it's like to be a dumb little boy. And I feel like Precure perfectly captures what it's like to be a dumb little girl. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And on the topic of Laura, Minatsu, or Summer, La Mer, when they are going to rescue Minatsu, one, there's a really cool scene where they're, like, surfing on top of a, uh, what's it actually called? I keep wanting to call it a wish cache. That's the Pokemon. A giant cat catfish. Fish. And, uh, La Mer is clearly like, oh my god, we gotta rescue Summer. And that's why I'm like, this feels kind of shippy to me, because, uh, there's that. There's the fact that apparently they slept in the same bed, which I don't think is something that they do every night. I think that usually Minatsu spends her time somewhere else. <laughs> Shout out to the fact that in the morning, Minatsu has fallen off of the bed. (laughs) See, that's what I mean, though, when I talk about, like, it perfectly captures what it's like to be that age of a girl. Because I saw that scene and I went, I have woken up in that exact position (laughs) next to one of my friends. Like, that's, this is capturing life. (laughs) Mm. I like Minatsu's ponytail look, but I really like the way that she looked with her hair down. She's so cute. I think many of the lead cures kind of have that. Uh, they they have a hairstyle during the day, and then if you have a scene where, like, it's late at night or something, or there's a sleepover or whatever, they usually have the hair down, and usually it works better for me. To be honest, I think it's just the exciting difference. Mm. Like, I think if they were hair down normally, and then you saw them with a ponytail, you'd be like, look how cute their ponytail is! It's true. Evidence, season finale of uh, My Next Life as a Villainess, they were all in ponytails, and you were like, holy shit, this it's is true. day. It's true. Look, I have a weakness, and it's pretty girls. We Boom, boom, boom. We love pretty girls. <laughs> Absolutely. 
We also mentioned, this isn't really a favorite moment exactly, but we mentioned that the animation in this episode was incredible, and you actually went and you looked into the guy responsible for it. Yeah, so apparently the storyboarder for this episode, 29 of of Tropical Rouge, is uh, Yuta Tanaka. And he has, according to the wiki, I hadn't heard of his name before, so I'm, it, I don't want to just read off of the Wikipedia, but apparently he has been a mainstay in the series as far back as uh, Yes Precure 5. He was an assistant director of several of those episodes. He eventually got promoted to director instead of assistant. And his most notable contribution has been... Uh, the series director for Go Princess, which Kat and I have been on record saying is our favorite season. And so apparently he's just, uh, he's widely known as like one of Precure's heroes who makes these episodes really pop and that sort of thing. So shout out to Yuta Tanaka. I'm going to try and be a little bit better at learning like the names of like different production people, but I'm really bad at it. For the most part, I mostly see the, uh, either the voice actors or the actors portraying the characters. It's funny because when it comes to animation, I sometimes can be like, oh, this looks a lot like that. I wonder if the same guy was involved. And usually it is. But when it comes to sound design, ah. I, I often can go, this sounds a lot like Thing, turns out, connected. That is true. Where did uh, Where did the My Hero come in? Go Princess. That was Go Princess. Okay, yeah, there yeah. were certain scenes where I was like, this sounds an awful lot like... And I'm pretty sure we picked up the composer for Film Gold in some Precure season at some right. point. Yeah. So, but no, I'm I'm really excited to see people who clearly love this series continuing to work on it. Yes. I want to see Horikoshi do character design for a season of <laughs> Precure, because he's drawn Precure before. He's drawn Cure Flora and stuff, so... I, I think love that would it. be cool. And for those who aren't familiar with that name, Horikoshi is the author behind My Hero Academia, the manga. So, yes. Joel, do we want to discuss the elephant in the room? Hmm. The kung fu elephant? <laughs> why? Everyone why? is. Why? There's got to be a pun we're missing, right? There has to be some sort of Japanese tropical elephant makeup something. <laughs> I mean, maybe. Because there are tropical birds. Their bird attack makes sense. Where is the elephant coming from? So the new attack is called Pretty Cure Land Beat Dynamic. And they do a dance. They, in this episode, all five Precure show feet. <laughs> they, 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 like, I'm sorry to bring it up, but it's true. So let me <laughs> let me set up a couple of pieces of information that we get in this episode. The legendary Precure had her own ring, just like, you know, the, the Tropical Club do, and is called the Land Ring. And I think that you pointed out that you thought that the power-up Laura got a couple of episodes ago was like the Sea Ring, which makes me think that the last one's probably going to be like Sky Ring. And maybe, maybe they'll have like a lava ring if they want to do like a fire to complement the earth and wind and, and water. But I think part of the reason that they picked an elephant is because it is a land animal. I don't know if there's a better creature that is associated with land that is also associated with uh, the tropics as a, as a region or whatever. But when they summon this uh, elephant, they get uh, new dresses and they look pretty great. Uh, we can go into more detail about a uh, discussion about that in a second. And then they all kind of do like, um, I don't know if it's exactly a tap dance, but they all kind of like tippity tap with their feet and then they all stomp and that summons this pink elephant that then like goes into a kick that hits the enemy and destroys them. I, it's a lot, you know, honestly. Yep. I have looked on the wiki and confirmed that Laura's ring is the perfume shiny ring. Oh, okay. But so. perfume is kind of like sea water? Yeah, I think you're trying to twist the facts. I am. I am. I just want some sort of cohesive business that makes sense to me personally. Mm. Also, something that I noticed they didn't give the cure name for the legendary pre-cure. In Go Princess, you meet the other, the previous era of 
Pretty Cure, and they have the exact same names as the cures today. So it's it's Cure Mermaid, Cure Flora, and Cure Twinkle. Twinkle. And then in Cura Cura, as we've been discussing, they eventually meet Cure Lumiere. And uh, what was the other one that had Cure Ange? Oh, um, was that, that Heart was Catch? Heart Catch. Okay. That was the Heart Catch movie. Right, okay. So... Other seasons that have had previous cures have given them names. And I think names are powerful and they're important and they're interesting. So the fact that we don't know the name of of Palm Tree Girl, maybe they're saving it. Well, and we also don't know the queen's name, the mermaid queen. And I'm pretty sure that they're the same person. Ah, okay. Yeah, maybe. So do you... Did you also see any particular reason why it was an elephant? Did you look into the details on that? Nope. I'm hoping that uh, Reddit will say something and we can bring it up during Tweets in a Bottle next week. (laughs) Absolutely. So let's talk about their new outfits. Absolutely. Coral is cute. (laughs) I had uh, some of the elements of this episode spoiled for me before the episode came out. And I saw a picture and it looked like Songo's dress was like, three times as wide as all the other dresses, and I was really concerned it was going to look silly. But in the actual show, it is not nearly so, like, balloon outward uh, sort of a look. So they all look pretty great, I would say. I think that Songo is one of my favorites. Uh, I would say that Asuka is one of my favorites. The um, papaya's hair grows a little bit longer, and the hair at the end of her new ponytail looks kind of spiky for for lack of a better word it kind of feels more liony to me when i see it so i kind of like that she almost looks like she could belong in a splash star yeah absolutely absolutely do you have a, a particular favorite out of all of them i was just looking their picture up so i could i could see them again really i i know this is a cop out but summers is really good I really like Summer. Kira Lemaire looks great. Songo looks great. Songo's is a little bit, like, too poofy, like you were saying. Mm. But no, I really love all of them. Flamingos kind of reminds me of, like, a flamenco dancer. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so I like that that kind of goes with her name. But no, it's it's great. They all get, um, I don't know, cape's probably not the right word, but they all get kind of, like, extended skirts that have, like, a shiny color to them, almost like the inside of a seashell. Oh, iridescent. Um, Iridescent, yes. So, yeah, I think they did a great job with the designs here, and yeah, I wonder if they're eventually going to get a form that they transform into for longer, like in the movies type of thing, or if it's Mm. only going to be during the power-up, but... I'm really curious what the movie is going to look like. I haven't heard any more news after hearing it was going to be a crossover with Heart Catch. Yeah. I hope that the Heart Catch girls play more of a role in this movie than the Yes Precure 5 girls played in the Healing Good movie. Yeah. Because they were just sort of not there for most of it. Yeah, absolutely. When we get to the movie's release and it is available with English subtitles so we can understand what's going on, do we want to include that in an episode of Cure of the What Now? Or are we going to do like a special episode? I feel like we should do a special episode. It's, okay. a, it's an exciting event. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You watched two episodes of Cure Cure this week, but you usually like to discuss Futari Wa first. What an interesting way to segue into that. Uh, <laughs> listen, listen, listen. I know I make this excuse a lot, and the reason I know that is because I just listened to like three of our episodes in a row, and I've said it in all of them, but I'm super tired. <laughs> We are all super tired. The Witch of Delays is slowly draining just a little bit of our energy every day. Yeah, no kidding. So, we've got the third seed of evil. I believe that uh, in the flashback that the Queen of Light showed uh, right before they destroyed Jakku King, I think that it explicitly showed three seeds shooting out. But also, I have been on the wiki and glance, and yes, there are only three seeds, so this is the final one. He... Shows up at a hospital, this evil guy, and he walks past a group of people and those people, doctors who work at the hospital, and they kind of like freeze in place. And then they turn and go, hey, director, what's going on today? And I wasn't sure if he was actually the director or not. But at the very end of the episode, there's a scene of someone coming up to him and be like, director, director. And he goes down a hallway and then someone else shows up from, like, the opposite direction, and the girl kind of spaces out again, and she looks at the new guy and is like, oh, director, I wanted to talk to you. So this guy has some kind of, like, 
inserts himself into the minds of the people around him. I think that's the same reality warping thing we've seen before, because each of the previous villains was erased from reality after they became the seed of evil. Okay, sure. But his thing is that he's absorbing lightning. So uh, we had the first one, Jura, I think, who absorbed uh, like a tsunami. And then the second one, she absorbed uh, a volcano eruption. This guy was absorbing a thunderstorm. He summons a robot that defeats itself. It charges at black and white and they jump out of the way and it smashes into a wall and then it's defeated. And they use the Marvel screw and it turns into a bunch of Gomenas. All right. Uh, and then that's basically it. The rest of the episode is kind of fluff. It's it's Nagisa and Honika, Honika going to a, uh, like a fair, um, or no, what do they call it? Festival. They're wearing yukatas. Uh, they look great in them. There's a little bit of, like, Nagisa still has a crush on uh, Fuji P, I think his name is. They bullied Poloon. <laughs> this is a mascot bullying episode. <laughs> they, they didn't bully... Well, okay. Poloon was promised that he was going to be allowed to go to the festival, but he got so excited about the festival that he wore himself out and was asleep. And instead of taking him in his compact form in their pocket the way that... They could if they wanted to. They leave him at home. And the rest of the episode is Poland trying to find them and showing up wherever they just were, but missing them by mere moments. So it was sad, but I wouldn't say they explicitly bullied him. I'd say that they tried to be considerate and they made the wrong choice. And then after that, it was just misery for him as a result of trying to find them and having short little stubby legs. Goro, goro. Goro, goro. Pecan. da da, Or whatever it is. <laughs> so I'm expecting something interesting to happen now that we've had all three seeds of evil. And they have an evil mansion that they're hanging out in. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for something. I'm hoping it's not just Jura shows up and creates a Zakenna. I've, I've seen this season. The Nagisa is going to stumble onto this mansion because she got distracted thinking about Takayaki. <laughs> and the girl is going to tell her future. Ah, okay. And then they're going to be girlfriends from that moment on. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I'm I'm really curious to see where they go from here because I assume their task is to revive Jock King. But how are they going to do that? Are they going to start collecting life energy from the planet? Are they just going to go straight to the Dokutsu zone? What do you think? It is hard to tell. One thing that I'm wondering about, just because it is a trope, is are the human minds beneath the seeds of evil still there? You know, is it possible that if you hit them with a um, a marble screw attack or whatever, will you revert them back to their human forms? Will the humans have different desires than the evil personalities? So I guess the most logical thing in terms of trying to revive the Dark King or trying to take over in his place would be to gather more energy like they kind of did in the last three episodes. But how many natural disasters are there honestly going to be? I don't know. So I, I'm assuming that they're going to have to do some kind of like absorb the energy from other people, a la all the other seasons of Precure, and then uh, Honoka and Nagisa are going to have to stop them. You know? Kind of, kind of obvious, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Ari and I. <laughs> Maybe the three bad guys can work together. So one will show up and create a Zakenna, a distraction, and then the key, the pre-cure have to stop them. And then the other two are going to be off doing something else evil that the cures can't stop because they're too busy with the other guy. Okay, I like that. There are two of them and only... There are three of the guys and only two of the pre-cure. Absolutely. The next episode is according to uh, the wiki, called Explosive Pretty Cure Rainbow Storm. That sounds like they're going to get a new special attack. It does. I did not think that's where that sentence was going when you started with the word explosive. My <laughs> mind just makes connections. <laughs> explosive. Uh, Nagisa's brother has dynamite strapped to his back. <laughs> Let's play a game, Precure. Oh, no. <laughs> Next week's discussion question, uh, which of the Precure would be put into jigsaw style puzzles and oh my what would you do to them? No, once again, the villain trio follows the two boys, one girl pattern. Yeah. Which honestly, I think that they do because 
the the series is supposed to be focused on girls, right? And so girls are the hero, who's the obvious villains, boys. But every once in a while, as a woman, you do meet other women who are villainous toward you. Yeah. So I think that's why they only do the one female villain. I think they prefer to have male enemies. Yeah, okay, I could see that. And... I don't remember if I predicted this explicitly, but it does appear that the Juna guy seems to be a lot more punchy, punchy, explosive power. And then uh, the new guy, whose name wasn't given, but is uh, Belzai Gertrude. What a what a strange name. Hmm. Anyways, he seems to be maybe a little bit more cerebral. So you 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 know we saw this with uh, Daruzin and what was his name Gui Gagaru or whatever. We saw this with Geki Drago versus uh, you know Ilkuba or whatever. You usually have less physically powerful but smarter character, and then big brawny beefcake that just punches really hard. And then woman who is uh, uh, incredibly beautiful and does kind of like mystic stuff. Watch her attack with her hair just like the last female villain did. (laughs) Yeah. It's all curled up. Like it looks like it could like uncoil and be like, (laughs) did you know, I think I've told you this before, but did you know that rattlesnakes are more dangerous than cobras because you can see a cobra's range of striking, but a rattlesnake is all coiled up, so you can't tell how far they can go. Yeah, it tries. It's it's a little bit more deceptive. Mm-hmm. And they can spring themselves. They can be like, Pew! they do the S curl. Interesting. This has been your rattlesnake fact. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have anything else that you want to talk about in this episode of particular note? Not really. I would like for Poloon to be less of a butt and more of a character. Yeah. Like, he, he really, he seems like he's supposed to be important, but he's so annoying and so, like, butt monkey-esque that it's hard to get behind him. Yeah, absolutely. I still, I stand by it. He's one of the cutest fairy designs, but he's not much of a character yet. He's significantly cuter than Meppel and Mipple. Like, mm-hmm. if if he could have their character development and replace them, I would be fine with that. Also, I will say, I don't like how over the top Mipple and Mipple were in the first couple of episodes with, oh my god, I love Mipple and I need to see her right now! But this episode did have a moment where, uh, when Nagisa and Honoka got into their yukatas, uh, they said something, or like Mepple said, like, oh, you two look great, but not as good as Mipple. And I thought that was cute. I do like it when it's kind of, like, toned down, but it does. it is clear that these two fairies love each other. That is sweet. Once again, I have no interest in the heterosexual romance. Oh, no. Between Nagisa and Fuji P. Fuji P doesn't have any character. Well, and that's the thing, right? We've talked before about how the reason shipping between the cures can work if you're interested in shipping characters is because they have so much built up together and they're, they go through fights and tragedies and like they spend a lot of time together. But someone like Fuji P is barely a character. All we know about him is that Nagisa thinks he's attractive. And yeah, he's a soccer player. There was a moment they were uh, going down some steps in the rain when a storm suddenly appeared and Nagisa fell and he caught her. So like he does, he tries to be, you know, kind and caring. But yeah, we don't, he doesn't get any screen time. And when he does, it's only for uh, Nagisa to be like, oh my God, he's so cute. Okay, but, like, if you had a conversation with him, we'd have more, like, information. We'd be more interested. Right, and Nagi says annoying around him. Yeah, yeah, you know, she absolutely I, I is. just, I don't have any patience for that. Grow a pair of henshin items and tell the boy you want to spooch his face. Okay, I like that. I like that a lot. Kira Kira. pre kira longest episode title, or longest series title in history. You finally hit one of my favorite peak meme moments. So let me tell you a story that has nothing to do at all with Precure. When I was in high school, a series came out called G Gundam, and I liked it a lot better than other Gundams that I tried to get into and couldn't, because in normal Gundam, it feels like someone's on a console inside of their Gundam and they're pressing buttons. And so I don't quite understand, like, how you're supposed to gauge whether one person is stronger than another because it's just a matter of did they press the enter key faster than their opponent. But in G Gundam, you could actually fight. Like, you're, you you would throw a punch, your Gundam throws a punch, that sort of thing. And so it was a lot more interesting. It was really campy. In college, I decided to go back and rewatch it from the very beginning. 
And there are moments where I was like, this is kind of a silly show, but I will stick with it because I have fond memories of it. But eventually there's a tournament arc, tournament arc, and the next time on G Gundam plays, and it says, in the next episode, Chibity fights a clown. And that was so ridiculous. And so stupid that I could not. I, Me and my friend who were watching it together, we stopped watching it. And I mean, looking back on it, that's probably not any more silly than like Poloon or like um, uh, uh, Momozona Love getting distracted because she's thinking of donuts and she ends up in like a fortune teller's house. But that line, in the next episode, Chibity fights a clown, it plays in my head like all the time. It haunts me in my dreams. It does. I can confirm. It's still coming up 10 years later. <laughs> so Kira Kira, pre-Cure, a la mode, episode 34. In the next episode, Yukari becomes a cat. <laughs> <laughs> You don't need to know anything about this episode. There's like gang warfare or something between fairies and cats, but they're both good guys. They're just both being manipulated by evil gas. But Yukari becomes a cat. I'm a cat. I'm a, cat. I'm a Yukari cat. I'm a fabulous cat. <laughs> but no, that's... I understand that maybe it's a little bit uh, cheesy, I guess, for lack of a better word, to be excited about your own content, but one of my favorite lines from our eight hour precure episode was me saying, like me summarizing the episodes I watched and going, Yukari becomes a cat for a little bit. And you going, what? And me going, we'll get to it. Don't worry. <laughs> Sometimes being a podcaster, peek behind the curtains, you, you, you want to have a reaction to things. You can't just go... Okay, that, that happened, because that's not interesting for your listeners. So sometimes when you say something that's really interesting or really funny, I, I might over-exaggerate my emotion because, you know, I want to fill the air with, with good uh, conversation. But in that moment, when you said that you card me a a cat, I blue-screened, and all I could say was, what? <laughs> uh, so it, the, the mechanism appears to be that if you headbutt your crystal animal... You switch places. You become the animal and the animal becomes you. Yeah. Uh, so, and Yukari, you, you and I talked about this when we watched the episode together. Yukari is the perfect character to turn into a cat because all the other characters would be freaking out and they would try to like find the other girls to be like, I've been turned into a bunny, a lion or whatever the case may be. But Yukari is just like, oh, I'm a cat. What a fabulous experience. I'm just going to be a cat. And he's like, okay, then. How a meowsing. How a meowsing. <laughs> I don't have anything really to say about this episode other than the fact that Yukari turned into a cat. <laughs> it was a really fun episode. I enjoyed it. And I love how good and pure CL is as a character. Mm. Like the fairies come to her and they say, we're doing battle with the cats. And she goes, you were right to come to me. I know exactly what to do. And she makes them cat friendly sweets. And like, CL, that's so, that's so nice of you. What a nice way to try to solve the conflict. I really did for a moment forget that this is a show about like just wholesome cinnamon buns. And I was like, is CL going to, like, lead the attack? Is she going to be good at, like, gang warfare? But then, no, yeah, she shows up and she's like, I made sweets. And I went, of course that's what CL would do in that situation. It's perfect. Right. And then Yukari comes up with this plan to get everybody to turn against her. And she's like, the leaders have to battle each other. The loser is going to leave forever. Or whoever doesn't win. Um... And CL's like, no, that's horrible. We don't have to do that. We could just eat sweets together. And Yukari's like, no, we're doing this. We're fighting. And she wins. And then she looks at her gang of cats and she says, you all have to leave now. Go. And CL's like, no, stop it. <laughs> and Yukari makes her fight her again. And she goes to fall off a cliff. And CL goes, are you doing this on purpose? And Yukari throws herself off the cliff and CL still insists on catching her. Mm -hmm. And it's so wholesome. I love you, CL, or Kirin when she's in fairy form. They're the same person. But yeah, no, that it is really interesting. And Yukari, once again, is sort of the uh, investigator of the group. She's kind of the one who notices things and kind of like quietly follows the thread. She figured out that Diablo seemed to be influenced Influencing this area and she acted in such a way as to draw him out i think the way she did it was a little strange but she needed know? to make everybody hate her because diablo feeds on hatred okay yeah but i i'm just saying that i 
I guess I'm wondering if there was another way that she could have done it. Like, if there might have been a way to make Diablo think that he had won and then catch him while he was gloating or something. Okay, okay, fair enough. But we've been talking about shipping. In Tropical Rouge, we have Manatsu Laura, a ship that I stan. In uh, uh, pre- in Futari Wa, we have Nagisa and What's-His-Face. Uh, we don't care about that ship. But in Kira Kira, pre Kirala Mode, episode 35, we get Aoi X Hemarine. If ship. you're interested in that sort of thing. Now, if you've watched this show up to this point, or if you've seen the whole season, you know that Yukari Akira is an actual thing that is addressed in the show. Uh, in that a guy shows up is like, I'm going to take Yukari away, and Akira gets upset specifically because that's my girlfriend. Yukari gets upset when Akira is around other girls. They are explicitly gay for each other. Y- you can't argue for against that, I don't think. Ciel and Bibri, pretty strong connection there with Ciel catching Bibri in, in the episode that we discussed a couple of weeks back. But Himari and Ao, I could see, like you said, it just being strong female friendship. Sort of. Aoi used the words... I love her in this episode. And maybe she means the kind of love that you have between your friends. Like, was it Aristotle who had, like, the different types of love or something like that? But it really felt like it was Aoi being like, Hemarine, you're shy, but you're cute and you're awesome. And Hemarine being like, Aoi, you are pretty and amazing and I want to smell your hair. <laughs> it really feels, you know, or like, I want to massage your feet. I want to, whatever, whatever... Uh, Hemarine's, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, love language is. She wants to do that for Aoi. <laughs> Absolutely. No, it was, it was a beautiful episode by the end, but I felt like the conflict was a little contrived. It didn't make any sense for me that as soon as one person was like, oh, why is Aoi hanging out with a, a commoner? That uh, Himari would be like, oh no, are Aoi and I even really friends? At the same time, I do get that she's kind of shy, and so her confidence is probably rattled pretty easily, but... Yeah, she was in an unfamiliar environment. She was in over her head and that sort of thing. So I could agree that maybe the difference between them could have been exaggerated more. There could have been, like, a stronger inciting incident, but, like, I do not care. There were two cute girls being cute. Um, they murdered Diable with a giant cream puff. They did indeed. Uh, yeah. Diablo is once again in this episode, he has regained his back two legs, basically just because he wanted to. I think the idea is that he's absorbed enough, like, hatred out of the hearts of people, uh, in, uh, they're not Azora. What are they? Ichigoza, I think, is the name of the city. Uh, but he's now back at full strength. He causes some, uh, disruptions at, uh, this event that Aoi's going to. He Marine is her plus one. And then they attack it, and Diablo is too strong, but then... He Marine's uh, baking expertise comes into play and they create a giant cream puff that destroys Diable and maybe he's gone forever. Spoiler alert, he is not gone forever. Uh, I know that because of future knowledge, the show makes no effort to say like, he'll be back. But I just happen to know that yeah, there's some more stuff that goes on with him. We're so, we're so close to my favorite scene with Diable. All right. I'm, All I'm right. really looking forward to it. I love this show. You were asking me what I want to do when you finish Kira Kira to kind of fill the Kira Kira corner. And I don't know because Kira Kira is so fun and good that it's hard to fill its shoes. We start over from the beginning. Or, no, just kidding. We watch it again and then we figure out what it's trying to say about the human condition. Madoka Magica is a treatise on. We watch only every third episode. So episode three, episode six, episode nine. And then when we get to the end, we just do a mod three, which is a math thing. And then we'll probably be on episode two and then episode five and then episode eight. It might change the viewing experience. Who knows? That seems like one way to consume media. <laughs> what? How many episodes of Kira Kira are you planning on watching next week? I will be watching three episodes for King of the What Now episode 30. For I'll, what of the what now? For Cure of the What Now. I'll be watching three episodes of Kira Kira Pre-Cure a la Mode. That would be episodes 36, 37, and 38. Beautiful. Now, we do have some tweets in a bottle this week. Wait. Waiting. I just realized... Low res pre cure. Yes. Uh, both the uh, Kira Kira episodes 
uh, specifically 35, the second one, and the Tropical Rouge episode had some amazing low-res pre-cure shots, and I think I'm going to make an effort to put every single one of them in the thumbnail because they are just amazing. And also, the best character in all of Kira Kira Pre-Cure a la mode is in fact the Gelato Crystal Lion. I love that thing. It's a little expression when I always like confused. It's, it's perfect. It's adorable. I also really like the low res precure girls. There's something about angry Songo when it's just like the lines and the little dots that makes it even more compelling. Like she seems even angrier than if you could see her full face. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's, it's emotion distilled is what it is. And I also like a sad low res humorine. But yeah, that's that's pretty much my thoughts on the low res girls. We do have one tweet in a bottle this week from Could that it be? one. It could. Okay. That one welder guy, James, once again, coming in clutch for the cure of the what now. James said, if he was in charge of titling this episode, and I think he means the episode of Precure, but he might mean the episode of the podcast, he would have called it Tropical Rouge Can Have a Little Plot as a Treat. <laughs> he was very, very excited that we finally got some plot stuff, which like... Yeah, absolutely. I kind of wish the stuff between the witch and the Densetsu Precure had been going since the beginning mm. of the series instead of only just now being introduced. But at least we've got something, right? And then he also said that the animation had lots of interesting choices and he thought that was really cool. Absolutely, for sure. I am curious. They brought up a couple of different kind of like mini, I don't know if they're plot points, but they uh, ideas. They mentioned that the legendary Precure was the one who fought the witch. And Monatsu goes, oh, the witch of delays? And Laura says, I'm not sure about that. Okay. And then the uh, legendary Precure shows up and she says, you must defeat the witch who became the witch of delays. I think she says you must save. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But the point is, is that there appears to be... The Witch and the Witch of Delays. And they seem to maybe be two different characters, or maybe one of them has lost its motivation power and has become the other one. But this just feels like her final form has yet to be revealed. And we have a flash from the Witch of Delays' point of view, a dream in which some girl is uh, running away, and it seems to very much be implied that it's probably the the legendary Precure, but it's not explicitly confirmed. But uh, the Witch of Delays is like, no, wait, where are you going? Why do you look so happy? Is it possible that the Witch of Delays has depression and, like, doesn't understand the actual emotions of people around her? Absolutely. I have been saying from the beginning, I think the thing with the Witch of Delays is that someone succeeded where she didn't, and instead of letting it encourage her to try harder, she gave up. Okay, yeah, I can see that. Um, And I think having depression and never getting out of bed is a huge part of that. Mm. So do you think, and I mean, this seems to be what's heavily implied to me, but does it feel to you like the witch was friends with the Precure before she became a Precure, and then they both made opposite choices and now must fight? I think so, yeah. Okay. That that kind of seems to be where they're going. Also, none of us have mentioned this, but we finally saw the butler come. Yeah. And yeah. and throw a yarn a da, and his was, like, super spooky. So I'm glad that we got something out of waiting for the butler to show up and fight. I did think it was going to be a little more dramatic. I thought he was going to pilot the Witch of Delays like a mech, but, you know. Yeah, I so the this episode, the Yarn A Da is not only stronger because it's like a super Zen Zen or uh, whatever Yarn A Da, but also because there's so many different things I have to fight that's attacking the city from all different corners. So I really was wondering, is that because the orb that created the Yarn A Da's was stronger or was the butler smart enough to infect something that he knew would be able to spread out like that? It'd be great if he was the cunning mastermind who could create a yarn a dog whose abilities were perfectly suited for a specific situation. But I think he's probably just going to throw the orb <laughs> and what he gets is what he gets. Yeah. Yeah. James did have one other thought that I thought was pretty interesting. How many times can I say thought in one sentence? James pointed out that mirrors are very prevalent in the second closing 
and was saying maybe that was foreshadowing for the mirror being their big attack. But also mirrors were a pretty big part of the first closing as well. They had the mirrors that they were dancing with. Oh, uh, yeah, that's doing... absolutely true. That's absolutely true. So I, I do think that that was foreshadowing a bit. I always expect them to get the item that they have in the closing as an item in the show, and it keeps not happening. Like, do you remember when I thought the link ring was going to be huge and healing good? Oh, yes, absolutely. And it showed up, like, once as a toy for Latte. It wasn't even a a pre-cure thing, but whatever. This is not a healing good episode. But no, good thoughts, James. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I will also say that uh, as a metaphor, the witch of delays at the beginning of the episode, she cries out and a mirror in her room shatters. And so that's probably a metaphor for the broken state of her mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nobody can send her their motivation because she's closed mm-hmm. off to it. She's too shattered. Absolutely. And that has been your do 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 final thought. Outro goes here. Thanks for listening, everyone. And don't forget to Tropica shine. I can't move. <laughs> Ha ha! What a great episode of King of the What Now, your One Piece podcast that started from the very beginning and stars these two doofuses. If you want to follow us on social media, Twitter is the best place to do that. I am at K-O-T-W-N underscore pod. And I am at Pirate Ghost Host. Absolutely, yes. We share all sorts of thoughts on there, some related to the podcast, some related to other things. But you can also reach us through email at kingofthewhatpod at gmail.com, or you can also find us on Patreon. We would love some subscribers or supporters, whatever the technical term is. Patrons. Patrons. So fancy and grown up. Uh, And you can find that at patreon.com slash king of the what pod you can find all sorts of things like bonus episodes and you get to see the full cold open candidates not just the ones that make it into the episode maybe someday if i learn to draw i'll put stuff up there we're always looking for suggestions and feedback and speaking of which please take a moment to rate and review our podcast wherever you get us from so itunes spotify scrivener that's for writing but wherever you listen to our podcast take a moment to leave a review it helps other people find us we are so grateful to all of our listeners and we couldn't do this without you absolutely word of mouth is super powerful so if you have a friend who likes one piece and they haven't heard of us just direct them to the latest episode and if they hate us they can tell us why and if there's an actionable item we'll try to please you that's how this works thank you everyone have a great day